Hello folks and welcome to the Booth of Truth 2.0 which is under construction um, at the moment. I have to reposition the camera and lights and the basic ventilation and so on. You can't see it. All you can see is this grey screen which God willing will become a green screen. Hooray! Yes, yes. You're welcome. Okay, so where are we? We're in the book uh, revolts against maturity the biblical psychology of man and we're in chapter 22 on regeneration a crucial chapter of course so let's hit the record and go 22 regeneration in some form Every civilization and religion is concerned with rebirth. It sees as a major necessity the need to start afresh, to break the bondage to some aspect of the past of the past. Uh, to break the bondage to some aspect of the past or present and to have a new man in a new world Historically, politics has usually concerned itself with this task in non-Christian societies. The purpose of politics has been the reordering of society and of the lives of men so as to deliver mankind or a people into a desired order. Man has thus recognised that a problem exists. The question is, what is the problem? According to the dictionary, a problem is a question proposed for a solution. Anything that is required to be done, something different. Something difficult to solve, but having a solution. If no solution is possible, then it is not a problem, but a tragedy. Thus, ultimately, Death comes to all men, and death, in this sense, is not a problem, but an inescapable fact. If I call ultimate death a problem, then I am declaring that I can solve or overcome it. It is possible to call death by... It is possible to call death by cancer a problem to be solved, but to say that death itself can be a subject of problem-solving is to break with biblical faith. Death as a problem was Christ's problem, and his atoning death and resurrection provided the solution for his elect. It is presumption for man to regard ultimate death as his problem. What a man considers to be a problem is thus revealing of the man our problems are also assertions of competence. If a man says that his wife is a problem, he is assuming that he can change her. If he says she is a burden, he is admitting the reality of the situation. Much marital friction results when husbands and wives regard each other as problems to be solved. It is typical of humanism to regard the environment the world around us and the people in it as the problem. Its answer is to remake the world and man in order to start afresh with a clean world. Most votes are cast and most politicians are elected on this premise. Force or coercion must be brought to bear by law on man and the world in order to abolish the evil around us. There's a difference between saying that this total environment of men and things is evil, which is humanism, and saying that because men are sinners, there are thieves, murderers, and dishonest men abroad who will do us harm, and often have done so. The humanistic premise is that evil is outside. It is in the environment, and in men only as products of the environment, the Christian knows himself to be a sinner saved by grace. All men have a common burden, sin and guilt. This is a problem Christ solved, not man, 
and the answer is in Christ's atoning grace. The need is seen by both as rebirth, but because the humanist sees it as his problem to solve, it becomes his duty to remake man. This necessitates playing God over men by governing, controlling, predestinating and remaking them. It requires political and religious tyranny in order to accomplish its purpose. As Dostoevsky said of his Grand Inquisitor in the Brothers Karamazov, he claimed, It has a merit for himself and his church that at last they have vanquished freedom and have done so to make men happy. Moreover, since the humanists claim to be able to solve man's problem means denying that God is a problem solver, it means also denying any sensitivity to God's claims on the part of man. On the other hand, a total sensitivity to man's claims must be asserted. Insensitivity to God and to moral absolutes is coupled to a total sensitivity to man without God. Rebirth or starting afresh, thus means starting without God, or dying to God in order to be alive to man. To be born again means some kind of break with the past. In Oriental thought, the burden of karma, the consequences or effects of past acts, are inescapable and must be worked out through remuneration. Metamonitosis. And must be worked out through reincarnation. I made burp with mouth. <laughs> burp in throat. <laughs> oh, little croak there, little, like a little froggy frog. Isn't that nice? They are worked out, however, by man, who gradually atones for his past and escapes from the burden of history into nirvana. The burden is history and the problem is salvation. Man can save himself, but history is a hopeless matter. As a result, Oriental thoughts has retreated from social problems into a quiescence with respect to history. Western humanism is seemingly activistic with respect to social problems, but this is its hangover from Christianity. If the environment is man's problem and man can save himself by remaking the environment of things and men, how can man escape activism with respect to social problems? Clearly, humanism, under the influence of Christendom, is concerned with social problems. However, lacking moral absolutes is its concern its concern its concern will diminish as its closeness to a christian worldview diminishes if there is no right or wrong then how can we call anything a problem except to believe in right and wrong henry miller is logical at this point the only evil is to believe that good and evil are moral absolutes from God. John Dewey could only call for growth in his great society. He had no norm to give growth any meaning. Gunther Stent has described the growing inner decay in the sciences because of the absence. Abs, I was going to say absolutes. absence of any standard of faith and a transcendental absolute. For him it means the end of progress. The activism of India died as humanism triumphed there. The activism of the West will also decline as humanism penetrates more deeply. When this happens to a society, the domination of men by men playing God remains, but any purpose other than a lust for power disappears. The only social activism which survives is thus the delights in exert
the delights in exercising totalitarian powers. The common opinion of the Pharisees was that the people of the land needed controlling for their own welfare. Since man is a sinner, clearly man does need controlling. But the question is, by whom? God or man? Is God's law sufficient for the government of society? According to scripture, it is sufficient, and the answer of our Lord to Satan's temptation to implement or add to, in reality to replace, God's word with man's word, was at every turn, it is written, Matthew 4, 1-10. For Christ, the function of man in relationship to God's law is ministerial, not legislative. That is, man must administer that law, not alter, add to, or revise it. As McDowell observed, it was impossible for Jesus to abide by his decisions in the wilderness and not be treated as a heretic by the religious leaders. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus answered, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? John 3, 3-4 Nicodemus understood what had been said. His problem was that he could not believe it possible for a man to be regenerated and to be changed without, in effect, losing all his lifetime of experience and re-entering his mother's womb. As Art commented, How could a man be born again? Nicodemus is at least not stupid. He expects us to grant the obvious physical impossibility. In that case, Christ is speaking figuratively and should explain the figure. The stress of the question is on how. If the stress were on can, it would mean a contradiction of Christ, namely that man cannot wipe out from his mental life all established habits of thought, all expressions of the past with its controlling presuppositions, any more than his physical organism can become a baby again. End quote. Nicodemus felt that it was impossible for a man to be reborn spiritually and mentally unless he were reborn physically, unless, in effect, his existing life were wiped out. In modern terminology, a radical brainwashing as yet unknown to man would be required. Nicodemus was not opposing the idea of rebirth, but rather our Lord's version of it, for him. The control of man and society by an elite group of men provided the realistic, if slow, means of remaking man. Our Lord's words, Except a man be born again, can also be translated, as the marginal readings make clear, born from above. A supernatural rebirth, a new recreation by God's sovereign acts, was clearly declared it was this that brought forth Nicodemus's unbelief. He was ready to believe that man, given enough time, could remake man, but to believe that God could do so miraculously was unnatural. Let us now examine. No, no. Let us examine now the like comment of a theologian in the Church of England. According to Davies, Ideas proverbially die hard. Indeed, in a sense, it may be said that, like old says, like old, I'm going to just try something new and improved. Oh yeah, I love this. Wow. Yeah, that's nice. Oosh, that's nice. Like old soldiers, they never die, but simply fade away. Ideas seem to bear a charmed life. They apparently are invulnerable against all attack, especially the attack of evidence. They finally fade away only when the attacks upon them exhaust themselves. One idea in particular, which is reluctance even to fade away, 
is the peculiarly capitalist Protestant idea of a self-contained individualism that men exist as separate, isolated individuals, that the individual is a microcosmos in himself. This idea is the roots, or one of the roots, from which has grown the theory of national sovereignty, which implies that a nation is self-existent. This same idea, which translates itself into politics as national sovereignty, is expressed in religion and theology as a doctrine of individual atonement. Christ died not for humanity as a unity, but for the world as a sum total of individuals. Christ died for men as separate beings. End quote. Not surprisingly, Davies looked to a one-world socialistic order to remake man. Although with his entrance into the priesthood, Davies lost his socialistic utopianism, he did not abandon his socialism. After Reinhold Niebuhr, I'm going to look up Reinhold Niebuhr because Reinhold Niebuhr sounds a bit too English, Englishized. Reinhold Niebuhr. Reinhold. Let's see, German. Reinhold Niebuhr. Neighbors. Everybody needs good neighbors. With a little understand. Niebuhr. Reinhold Niebuhr. Reinhold Niebuhr. Reinhold Niebuhr. Reinhold Boer. Reinhold Niebuhr. Oh, I love it. Mm. Lovely. Very nice. Reinhold Niebuhr. Boer. 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 After Reinhold Niebuhr, Davies had gained a socialistic realism, he recognised that we solve our existing problems at the cost of creating new and still more difficult problems. In other words, man does not solve the problem, he merely changes its form. Well and good. Davies saw the human scene clearly up to a point. Indeed, he wrote that, quote, All the gains and the progress of modern Europe have resulted in increasing the scale and depth of the problem something wrong there. It reveals the most terrible of all moral contradictions. It shows how even the good of which human nature is undoubtedly capable seems to end in evil. End quote. The need, according to Davies, is for a radical solution, and his answer seemed to be genuinely orthodox, as he wrote, quote, the one fundamental remedy for man's plight is that human nature shall be radically recreated, refashioned, so that society will be able henceforth to act not out of the centre of self-will, but from a new centre transcending all the separated, isolated egoisms of individuals. As we have now seen, all action which arises from self-will, however good it may be in intention, is inevitably self-defeating, there is within it a principle of corruption. Therefore, if human action is to be continuously good, uninterruptedly progressive, free of the dialectic of self-prostration, it must proceed from a new source, a new will in which all men can participate. There is no other cure for the disease of a corrupted human nature. As we have also reasoned, uh, that is quite an involved scene reason to believe. Oh, that's a good bit. As we have also seen reason to believe, this is exactly a remedy which lies beyond the capacity of human nature. Man cannot start from anything but his self-will, whether in the form of naked individualism or disguised as group interest. End quote. It would be possible to spend much time analysing the undercurrent of heresies in this statement, but for the present, let us grant Davies his desire for regeneration. He then asserted that, quote, 
to abolish egoism as a source of behaviour, to act out of the supreme, all-embracing will of God, means that every individual must become a new human being. End quote. Davies meant every last individual bar none, not a simple majority or a strong minority. Here, very clearly, is a non-biblical idea. Moreover, Davies admitted that it is impossible in any generation, and he raised the question, what possible relevance can the Christian hope of a redeemed world have in our actual social situation? Davies held that, quote, the radical reshaping of human society is not the work of Christians in isolation, exercising a merely personal influence in corporate activities, end quote. The kingdom of God is eschatological and not of this world. What is of this world is the united social order, Davies envisions, quote, in which individuals only find rights in social relationships, end quote. But both law and the privileges man enjoys under law are God's gifts to man. If quote-unquote rights are socially derived, then the social order is the de facto God of man. For Davies, again, after ni- after Niebuhr, Buhr, Buhr, Buhr. Let's go back to Google Translate, translate.google.com. Niebuhr, after Niebuhr, 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 Buhr. I like that, open mouth. Hmm, lovely. What the, what? Niebuhr. 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 After Niebuhr. Niebuhr. Hey, bother. Niebuhr. For Davies, again after Niebuhr, the doctrine of creation is a quote-unquote myth. Is God is also essentially a limiting concept, or at best, a limited being, not the omnipotent and sovereign Lord. As a naive believer, Davies gave assent to more more than he allowed. I'm not quite sure what that means. I'm not quite sure what this means. Hmm. I said omnipotence instead of omnipotent. Oh! Uh, where am I? All right, we've got some kind of rogue element here. All right. Not the omnipotence and... Hang on a second, what is this? What is happening here? I don't even know what is happening. Davy, Davy Crockett. Not the omnipotence and sovereign Lord. As a naive believer, Davies gave assent to more than he allowed for in his intellectual framework, as his credo gives evidence. He saw the needs for rebirth, but for Davies, it was not Christ working in the hearts of men which changed society and which offered hope but a social rearrangement of society. His social rearrangement, moreover, carried no mark of God's law. All the same, Davies was aware of the importance of faith, as one footnote makes clear. Quote, Writing about the decline of serfdom in Russia in the early 19th century, Alexander Herzen says, In those days... There used to be a patriarchal, dynastic affection between landowners and their serfs. Today there are in Russia no more of these devoted servants attached to the race and family of their masters. And that is easy to understand. The landowner no longer believes in his power, 
He does not believe that he will have to answer for his serfs at the terrible day of judgment, but simply makes use of his power for his own advantage. Read Memoirs, Volume 1, page 34. However, Davies' theology is too weak to support a biblical doctrine of regeneration. His position is neo-orthodoxy, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. 2 Timothy 3.5 Man must be remade, but by whom and how? Nicodemus saw it only as a long, slow process whereby man remades his world and thereby remade himself. An elite leadership would have to provide the method, force and impetus for such a step. Nicodemus was ready to agree that man needed remaking, but he wanted a realistic and practical plan. He did not say, can a man be born again, but how can a man be born when he is old? John 3, 4. Jesus answered this question as to how it is done. Except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. John 3, 5. Water signifies forgiveness of sins and purification as set forth in baptism. The Spirit means that man's regeneration is the act of God the Holy Spirit who regenerates man into the perfect humanity of Jesus Christ so that man, created in God's image, is recreated in that same image in and through Jesus Christ. This rebirth is not man's work and it is therefore beyond man's understanding. John 3, 6 Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. John 3, 7 and 8 Hart's comment here is very good. Quote, the obviously strange experience ideals and hopes of a man born of the Spirit may to the natural man be foolishness, but the facts exist all the same. The facts exist. Los hechos exist in. Le fait exist. Le fait? Le fait accompli? But the facts exist all the same. Notice that it is not the spirit, but the man born of the spirit who has the wind's mysterious character. End quote. The actions of the believer are to the ungodly incomprehensible because history is for him an entirely naturalistic and totally imminent process. He cannot imagine a force or power beyond history governing man in history. Everyone that is born of the Spirit has this characteristic, since he is born again from above, his motive power is from above. And the more he grows in sanctification, the more his motive power manifests itself in him. The reaction of Nicodemus was, How can such things be? John 3, 9 Like Davies, Nicodemus in his day was a religious leader, a master of Israel, John 3.10. By profession he believed in God and upheld God's order. In reality, he had moved in the direction of Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor. God represented the ideal, the reality is man, and the motive force of history must come from man. If man is to be remade or reborn, it will have to be a man-centred job. Historical development and epistemological self-consciousness have brought the issue into sharper focus than it has ever before been, but the issue has not changed. Humanistic man regards his remaking as a problem for man to solve. He even speaks of God and the knowledge of God as a problem to be solved. In so doing, he rejects revelation and he rejects God's sovereignty. If man is remade by man... 
then man is sovereign. If only God can regenerate man, then God is sovereign. Davies is right in this respect. Man's solutions have aggravated man's plight instead of solving it. Ah, schnapp. Okay, the lights have gone out. Sorry about that. Didn't pay the bills. The lights have gone out. Chuckle, chuckle, chuckle. All right, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. The Power Hour in the Booth of Truth 2.0000000. Okay, uh, if you want to. Thanks for tuning in. Um, that was an awesome longer chapter, like that for what that information is worth, I don't know. Uh, yeah, like that. I uh, hope you enjoyed it too. Enjoy, is that the word, right word to use? Yeah, it's it's been, it's been always good to have you with me. And that was uh, a book, as usual, by R.J. Rushtuni. The book is entitled Revolt Against Maturity, The Biblical Psychology of Man. 25, 23, 25. 23, 23, 23 minutes, 18 seconds long. Yeah, it's been awesome to have you with me. Um, if you're going to support the work, like, share, comment. Thank you for those who have been liking and sharing and commenting. It's so great. Uh, it's super, super. Um, yeah, it's just awesome to have this set up here a, a little bit better than before. It is really a tremendous blessing I tell you what thank you to those that are making it possible if you want to help me do more better work I'm doing more better work hopefully uh, you can go to nathanteacher.com forward slash donations and make a little donation so God bless you and hope to see you soon <laughs>